Muy, muy buenas tardes. Muy buenas tardes. Hoy concluye la Elizabeth Cropper. Eh, dicta su, su última ponencia, que el, corresponde a la cátedra del, del Museo del Prado, con el título Los críticos y rivales de Malvasía desde Roma hasta Madrid. Y la verdad es que es, es, es el, la oportunidad de, de agradecerle a Elizabeth eh, el, es, su participación en, en esta cátedra del Prado, agradecerle el, digamos, el, el desarrollo de, todo, de todas las ponencias, que, tanto, tanto de las conferencias abiertas, las conferencias magistrales como los, los seminarios. Eh, no, solo, no solo agradecerle su aportación académica a, a la Cátedra del Prado, sino también su compañía durante estas semanas en Madrid, co trabajando con nosotros, eh, colaborando con, con el Prado, ha sido... Un, un, un placer y un, un orgullo ¿eh? y te queríamos te quería transmitir este, este agradecimiento de parte de todos ¿no? y también agradecer por supuesto la presencia de, de todos vosotros de todos ustedes en este en esta nueva cátedra del, del Prado y esperando que haya sido que haya sido lo más lo más productiva eh, posible con esto pues, le voy a dar la palabra ya para que eh, presente su última conferencia a Elizabeth Cropper. Muchas gracias. Thank you so very, very much. Uh, I thought I would just start out by saying a word about this uh, image with which I began all my lectures, because some of you may not know that it's the ceiling of part of the I am Pay Building at the National Gallery, where um, my center is housed. And if I were not here at the Prado tonight, uh, I would in fact be under this dome, uh, having a very uh, lavish, I think, banquet uh, in honor of the 75th anniversary of the National Gallery in Washington. And it's just 75 years ago today that uh, President Roosevelt uh, gave the speech under this dome. Uh, opening the National Gallery. So um, it's a very big day for us. It's not only St. Patrick's Day, but it's a big day for the National Gallery. And I, of course, have to recognize um, that compared to the Prado, which is about to celebrate its uh, 200th anniversary, 75 years is really uh, very, very little. Uh, in many ways, we're quite similar as institutions, as national institutions, primarily uh, as painting galleries, collections of pictures, although, of course, uh, the, Prado, the history of the Prado collections is so much richer. Uh, I can sort of point with some pride to the fact that we, we leapt ahead a little bit uh, 35 years ago when um, the National Gallery, under the leadership of Paul Mellon, the son of our founder, Andrew Mellon, decided to create the Center for Advanced Study in the Visual Arts, which I am now uh, the dean. And so here we are, and in this case, we got a little bit ahead of the Prado, but I'm now uh, so thrilled to see that the Prado has inaugurated this wonderful um, institute of its own in uh, the Cazon and um, is catching up very, very quickly. And I'm very, very proud uh, to be here uh, as the um, occupier of this uh, Cathedra of the Prado. And I, I just want to thank uh, Miguel Sugaza and Miguel Falomia so much, in addition to all of the staff of the Prado for their generosity and hospitality and for their friendship uh, in the time that I've been here. I used to be able to say that CASVA was the only research institute within a national gallery. I can't say that anymore. So I think we form two very special and connected um, institutions. So to turn to the, the matter in hand and to conclude uh, my thinking in the last uh, lecture for the Cathedra, the title I gave it uh, about the critics and rivals of Malvasia from Rome to Madrid um, implies that Carlo Cesare Malvasia, the Bolognese historian who's been at the center of my talks, was also at the center of international debate and controversy. 
And this is, of course, true, but it might have been more accurate to include his supporters retitling my lecture, Malvasia, his friends, critics, and rivals from Paris to Rome and Madrid, because he did have a few supporters. And even while focusing on the 17th century, as I have been doing, we should recognize more recent sympathetic interpretations of Malvasia coming from Spain, um, also in Italy, notably in the brilliant defenses by Giovanna Perini Falesani, and from the English-speaking world as well, including my own CASVA research team. For these lectures, it's been um, important to um, link Malvasia's critical approach and historical writings, I'm going to go back here, to the paintings here at the Prado. And I chose to concentrate on the Karachi school, especially on these four artists, because this group lies at the heart of the Felsida Pitrice, in which the life of the Karachi family and that of Guido Reni uh, are the most extensive, with the lives of Domenichino and Albani following closely behind. Now, even though, as you heard uh, a couple of weeks ago, Malvasia's account of Guercino is short and reliant on the family archive, this private artist had to be the fourth character in my story. As you'll recall, in the opening pages of the life of Guido Reni, Malvasia determined that four painters, Guido, Domenichino, Guercino, and Albani, each excelled in individual ways that placed them even beyond their teachers, who had themselves overcome the exhausted practices of the past. This series of excellences, whether in grace and celestial ideas, erudite invention, the expression of emotion, the force of chiaroscuro, and the beautiful organization of colors, or, as we heard last week, in poetic scherzi and grace, was an index of the advancement of painting in Bologna, a validation of the Karachi's reform of art. It also testified to the efficacy of the Karachi's Accademia degli Incaminati, in which the judicious imitation of a broad stylistic spectrum of art and of nature took precedence over the study of antiquity or canonical examples set by Raphael and the Roman school. It was because of the success of this academy that the great Luigi Lanzi, the great art historian Luigi Lanzi, would write in the 1790s that the history of the Karachi was the history of painting in Italy for two centuries, adding, quote, that no other school in Italy has been described by a more capable pen. And of course, he's referring to Malvasia. Like the members of the Accademia degli Incaminati, whose very name conveyed the idea of walking forwards on a straight path, Malvasia believed that the world could and must move forward through innovation, or novità. This was as, as important to his sense of history as the principle of tradition that I've also emphasized, a principle opposed to Giorgio Vasari's cyclical concept of death and birth, rupture and renaissance. Now, Malvasia opens the life of Angelo Michele Colonna, one of the artists who did come to Spain, with a peroration on novelty, which he'd originally intended for the life of Guido Reni, but he put in this life instead. And he writes, novelty is the condiment that satisfies every taste, the light that dazzles every sight, the comet that steals all praise from the stars. Novelty enters the ocean and discovers how much land a dove and of course, the play here is upon the word Colombo, by which he means to refer to Cristoforo Colombo, a significant figure in this 17th century discourse on novelty, that we see how much uh, of the ocean a dove may conquer. In cities, it makes yet more sumptuous amphitheaters and tombs arise. It inspires artists, and it tramples on firmly established and universal pr practices. It's a quite a, a radical position. In general, writes Malvasia, it corrects laws, breaks up order, alters customs, and changes the world, which, and he concludes in a very beautiful paradox, cannot grow old in the state in which it was born because it cannot die in the state in which it lives and which it has already passed. 
And I'm showing you here this print from uh, Jan van der Straat's Nova Reperta from the very beginning of the century, in which he already provides us with a graphic vision of the significance of such novelty throughout Europe around the turn of the new century, including, of course, saddle and gunpowder, America, and uh, various other uh, scientific discoveries. Now, my concentration on this quadrumvirate of followers of the Karachi has not allowed for any investigation of Malvasia's treatment of Bolognese artists who actually worked in Spain. And I think I would be remiss in at least not noticing this. They are an important part of the history of relationships between Bologna and Spain, one of our other sort of minor themes in these lectures, and Malvasia gave them considerable attention. The central figures here are Pellegrino Tibaldi, of whom he had no portrait, who worked for Philip II from 1586 to 1595, Angelo Michele Colonna, who left for Spain in 1658 with his partner Agostino Mitelli, returning alone in, uh, in 1662 after Mitelli's death. In both cases, Malvasia regretted having to compensate for not seeing their works with his own eyes in Spain firsthand. For Tibaldi, he cited the extensive description of the Escorial by the Cremonese Hieronymite Ilario Mazzolari, published in Bologna in 1648. In Le Reali Grandezze dell'Escoriale di, di Spagna, which it bears an interesting uh, dedication to uh, Virgilio Malvezzi, the Escorial was praised as a marvel greater than those of Greece or Rome or of ancient Egypt. It was the work of a king whose new empire reached across the sea. And this is a really wonderful engraving, quite well known uh, in that book. The Escorial was, in short, a brilliant novelty of the modern world, even if, through the references to the Temple of Solomon, it also acknowledged the past. Malvasia excerpted only the description of the library frescoes uh, from that account, hoping to provide an instruction and delight to painters and readers alike. Like the thought experiments of Aguki, which we have discussed uh, in earlier lectures, and his ekphrasis of uh, Anibale's Sleeping Venus, these descriptions could be visualized by a reader far away, though they could never, of course, replace the splendor of the king's library. In the case of Angelo Mich Michele Colonna, the situation is very different. Colonna was a friend of Malvasia's, supplying him with much information, and had even decorated Malvasia's country house. Still alive when the Felsina was published, he could be included only because his inseparable partner, Mitelli, had died in Madrid in 1660. On their arrival in Spain, the quadrature of decorators was set to work in the Buen Retiro and the Palacio Real, under the unwelcome supervision, I should add, of Diego Velázquez. In recounting their unhappy story, Malvasia includes snippets in rather broken Spanish of Colonna's conversations with the king. He says little about their work, writing instead about the artist's reluctance to compete with Titian, their ill health, their desire to go home, and their amazingly familiar proximity to the king, whose power to keep them in Spain was, however, absolute. In all of this, Malvasia was doing his job as a historian, collecting up eyewitness memories from those who were alive before these were lost. Now, in my introductory lecture, I also referred to the importance of the history of collecting in modern Spanish art history and explained that I would not deal with that very much. The work of documenting the royal collections has been done very well, and much material is now available on the Prado website. Much archival material, which was very difficult to see before, is now available to scholars. And instead of that, I wanted to look at some of the Prado's Bolognese paintings, and we haven't looked at all of them by any means. I wanted to do this through the critical framework provided by Malvasia, returning them, as it were, to Bologna, or at least Italy, just for a moment. Now that we all have gotten to know these works a bit better, it seems worth asking if they constitute a collection as such, or represent royal collecting as conventionally understood. To give a few examples, as we know, the two great mythological paintings by Nibale Caracci and Guido Reni were purchased in 1664, behalf of the king, by the Spanish Viceroy of Naples, from the estate 
of the Marchese Giovanni Francesco Serra di Cassano, who had fought for years for Spain against the French in northern Italy and in Spain itself. His collection, we must imagine, at some point decorated his feud in Cassano in the Kingdom of Naples, where his wife, Maria Giovanetta Doria, raised his family. Mortally wounded at sea in 1659 on his way home, he entrusted the Barone D'Amato with a ring for his wife, Maria. Philip IV, mindful of his debt to this extraordinary man, provided dowries, positions, and pensions to his children, income to the widow, upon whose death in 1663 the sale took place. In securing these works through an intermediary for a considerable sum, Philip was enriching his collection, but surely he was also helping to liquidate the estate of one of his most loyal servants. Guido's Madonna della Sedia, another work we considered early on at some length, was, I suggested, a carefully directed gift from Italy, well suited in its stylistic references and imagery for the Tuscan consort of the King of Spain awaiting an heir, and paralleling the Annunciation given to the Queen of France, uh, this painting here on the right, which we've seen also in my first, second lecture, perhaps. Both queens, writes Malvasia, decorated their apartments with these paintings. They were then neither altarpieces nor devotional images, but rather private works for contemplation by royal women. Domenichino's little triumphal arch for his friend Giambattista Agucchi may have been a gift that was never received, for it was in the possession of Carlo Maratta in Rome when he died in 1713. Together with hundreds of other works, it would be sold to Philip V and Isabella Farnese by Maratta's daughter in 1722. Once in Spain, it slept in quiet anonymity until it was recognized by Perez Sanchez in 1965, who immediately saw its importance and recognized its value. Its arrival in Spain, however, was truly a stroke of luck, and only a little less so was the acquisition of the two early works by Guaycino that we looked at. Prince Niccolo Ludovisi bequeathed these to Philip IV in 1665, uh, 1664, the year of the Serra acquisition, and just a year before Philip's own death, presumably in gratitude for the king's support of his title to Piombino, for which he'd already paid a considerable sum in money and art decades before, and also for other appointments. These works had been commissioned by the prince's ancestor, Cardinal Archbishop Alessandro Ludovisi, and they had helped to make Guarcino's career, as we saw. This gift may, in fact, have held greater significance for the giver than for the king who received it. Camillo Massimi's gift to the king in 1654-5 of a pair of paintings by Guido Reni and Guarcino, as we've also seen, was a clever improvisation. As the papal nuncio sat out his long wait in the Spanish countryside, he must have wondered if this gift would ever be received. Of the early history of the pair of works by Francesco Albani, discussed last week, we sadly know nothing before their appearance in the Buen Retiro in 1701. The Herrera Chapel frescoes, showing you the ones here now in Barcelona, but we were fortunate enough to see uh, the wonderful uh, fresco, detached frescoes, uh, several of us last week, which have recently been conserved and, and look so wonderful now. Uh, these do have a clear history, but their arrival in Spain, once again, depended on a series of almost miraculous interventions. We're truly fortunate that they survive. Now, my point is not to dismiss the history of collecting, but to call attention to the unique stories that these paintings bring with them, which risk being lost, I think, in a celebration of royal collecting. Their stories also remind us of just how rare Bolognese paintings were in Spain at the time of Malvasia's writing, and how precious these exceptionally acquired works are today. If it was difficult to attract Bolognese painters to Madrid, it was no easier to collect their work, despite the efforts of many. The Prado paintings are exceptional in other ways, and I've tried to press in these lectures beyond their current status as gallery paintings, hanging side by side, to understand the unique character of their inventions, their formats, and their functions. 
In Guido's Atalanta and Hippomenes, we are presented, I've argued, with an Ovidian myth cast in the form of a rhetorical and logical dilemma, following contemporary interpretation of the text, rather than a conventional, lyrical, or poetic invention. The special scale of Domenichino's triumphal arch needs first to be recognized and then explained, I think, as the format of an allegorical portrait cover linked, perhaps, to the portrait of Giovan Battista Agucchi, dedicatee of the arch himself. Now, I realize here this will arouse tremendous controversy among my Italian colleagues, but I present it to you as a hypothesis, as I did some weeks ago. The gifts from Camillo Massimi constitute in themselves emblems to be seen as delightful painted versions of the sort of images more often found in print rather than as mythologies or fables in the conventional sense in painting. And we looked at several of these uh, in the past, seeing how much uh, Guaccino makes his little painting conform to the image of a printed emblem. And in the case of Albani, as I tried to show last week, I wanted to establish the importance of his scherzi for the future of painting. Painting, I would say, of peace rather than of war, especially in France, even if his subjects remained in the world of mythology rather than penetrating contemporary fantasies in the manner of Watteau. Now, not all of my insights rely on Carlo Cesare Malvasia, who may indeed never have seen any of the paintings that we've been looking at. But my work, like that of others, would have been impossible without his. Malvasia's fundamental understanding of the character of each artist his appreciation of their personal style, his sympathy for their subject matter, and his documentation of their work shaped the history of Bolognese painting for centuries. Why then, a big question, has his reputation suffered even longer than the dismissal of Bolognese painting itself? The story of the triumph of the ideal classical style of Arcadian Rome at the end of the 17th century and of neoclassicism in the following decades cannot be my subject. I'm sure you're happy to hear that tonight, but that would embark on a whole new series of lectures. Yet the shift in values from those of Malvasia, who championed the painterly and coloristic values of Titian, Veronese, Tintoretto, and Correggio, and of those modern Bolognese who reinvigorated painting by imitating them, to the Roman ideals of Giovanni uh, Pietro Bellori is essential to understanding Malvasia's fortune. At this moment, Kunstliteratur, as I defined it in my first lecture, goes beyond interpretation or explanation of painting and becomes an active force in artistic change. This direct influence on criticism on practice today, which I think we see everywhere, is by no means new. Now, Malvasia was not working in isolation. Regional responses to and continuations of Giorgio Vasari's lives were springing up all around Europe, from Genoa to Venice, Naples, Ferrara, and even Florence. From the point of view of Bologna, however, second city in the Papal States, the only genuine rivalry was with Rome. And Giovanni Battista Bellori's account of the lives of a select group of mostly contemporary artists was always in Malvasia's sights. The first volume of Bellore's Vitae dei Pittori, Scultori e Architetti Moderni appeared, as you see it here, in 1672 with a dedication to Jean-Baptiste Colbert, Minister and Secretary of State to Louis XIV, beating Malvasia into print by some six years. Where Malvasia was prolix, Bellore was disciplined. Where, Mal where Malvasia was inclusive, Bellore was selective. And where, in the words of Julius von Schlosser in his book on art literature, Malvasia produced, quote, a document of the puffed up Seicento style, viewed with horror by the classicists of the following century, Bellori's prose exemplified the anti Marinist ideals of the circle gathered around his patron, Queen Christina of Sweden, which in 1689 would become the Academia degli Arcadi. Writing in early 20th century Vienna, Schlosser located Bellori in a chapter headed Universal Florentine Roman History because he wrote, by 1600, 
Rome had become the cultural capital of Italy and would soon recover its status as Caput Mundi. Such, quote, formerly important world cities, he says, as Bologna and Venice were reduced to provincial status. Malvasia is to be found in Schloss's book under, quote, local historiography of the art of Italy, a value for the material he preserved, but Schlosser cautioned, be careful about his cutting tongue and fiery nature. Now for Malvasia, it was inconceivable that Bologna, home of the oldest university in Europe, and actually I, my colleague David Garcia Cueto corrected me on that. It's the, I think the, the um, oldest Christian university in Europe, which is important. And with a cosmopolitan culture that shared scientific discoveries and exchanged literary and artistic production all the way across Europe could be seen in these terms. His dedication of the Felsina Patrice to Louis XIV trumped Bellori's to Colbert. Here we see uh, he dedicated to Louis XIV, not just to his minister. And this dedication would be rewarded by a miniature portrait of the king encircled by diamonds. This is the second one sent by the king. The first one was stolen en route to Bologna. In Malvasia's telling, Bologna is at the center of the history of the peninsula, from its ancient Etruscan beginnings to its resistance to the Visigoths and the survival of its ancient monuments. And in modern times, it's supplying in the manner of ancient Rome of artistic talent to the world. No other state, province, far less a single city, could match the quantity and quality of Bologna's painters, Malvasia insisted. For him, the Caracci were self-evidently Bolognese, as were their students, and it was in Bologna that the reform of painting had been accomplished. And here, Malvasia's preference for the work of Ludovico Caracci and Guido Reni, and his reserve concerning the, and especially I would point out here, um, Guido's public commissions in fresco in uh, Bologna, the great dome in, uh, or semi-dome in San Domenico, and the wonderful Pietà dei Mendicanti, singled out as great masterpieces by Malvasia. And he had great reserve concerning the accomplishments of Anibale after he left Bologna, where he was uh, working in this very caragesque, coloristic, Lombard manner uh, for Rome, where, of course, he changed his style quite dramatically. Bellori, by contrast, begins his life of Anibale Caracci by praising the divine Raphael and giving some attention to Anibale's early years. He then goes on to write that the painter was long anxious to go to Rome to see the work of Raphael and the remains of antiquity. On arrival, he was, says, uh, says Bellori, quote, overcome by the great knowledge of the ancients, and he devoted himself to silent contemplation of their art, end quote. Where Malvasia folded the successes of the Karachi Academy into the continuing life of the Alma Mater Studiorum, Bellori claimed that only two masters had produced schools in modern times. One was Raphael, the other Anibale. He acknowledged that some pupils stayed in Bologna to work with Ludovico, but he insisted that, quote, Anibale, in addition to teaching his family, had nourished the greatest geniuses, including Albani, Guido, Domenichino, Lanfranco, and Antonio Caracci, end quote. Bellori's story, which is clearly uh, wrong, had everything to do with his Roman audience, with his position as secretary of the Accademia di San Luca, and his close relationship with the French Academy that opened in Rome in 1666. Where the Roman Raphael was divine and the Roman Anibale the savior of painting, there was little interest in establishing that the new style had in fact been created in Bologna, and that this had come about through the Caracci's dedication to arriving at truth not through authority, but through argument. In addition to Michelangelo de Caravaggio and Federico Barocci, and such foreigners, as it were, as um, Rubens and uh, Pusa, here's the head of uh, Caravaggio and here Rubens in Bellori's book, Bellori also included in his book the Bolognese, Agostino Caracci, Domenichino, and Giovanni Lanfranco, as well as Alessandro Algardi thereby appropriating them from Bologna for Rome. 
The lives of Francesco Albani and Guido Reni were to have followed, only the second volume uh, was never published. In introducing his Storia Pittorica della Italia, Luigi Lanzi wrote of the need to write about artists of the middle rank from all over Italy and of the dangers of simply assigning pupils to such great figures as Raphael or Correggio without foundation. When he wrote that keeping silent about the middle rank is the job of a good orator, but not of a great historian, he clearly had the rigida massima, as he called it, the rigid maxim of Giovanni Pietro Bellori in mind. Bellori's rigid maxim was you could only write about the very, very best and he only published lives of 12 of them. Bellori was the good orator, narrowing his field to artists like Anibale he felt he could praise. Malvasia, rejecting rhetorical encomia, wrote as a historian, who not only included lesser artists establishing their true artistic genealogies, but he was also prepared to criticize even the greatest reputations. And that included not only his beloved Bolognese, but also the divine Raphael of Urbino. Now, 1678, the year in which the Felsina was published, was not the moment for historical truth in Rome, but rather a time for hagiography and the celebration of Rome's ancient past and modern accomplishments in the face of economic and political decline that would eventually see power and influence yielded to France, a situation that has been discussed brilliantly by Giovanni Pervitali. These accomplishments, these modern accomplishments, included Anibale Caracci's frescoes in the Farnese Gallery, which in the eyes of all combined the Bolognese reform with the ideal beauty of the ancients and Raphael. But it was Raphael and the antique that provided the fundamental justification for Roman superiority. Bellori was a leading protagonist in this mo mo movement, making his own small collection of antiquities and publishing his explication reprinted by Malvasia. Malvasia is quite generous in incorporating information, even by people he doesn't like, um, in the Felsina of Anibale's Farnese frescoes to accompany Carlo Cesare's engra uh, Carlo Cesio's engravings. Bellori collaborated with Pietro Santo Bartoli on illustrated publications of antiquities, including the lavishly produced Admiranda Romanarum Antiquitatum, which you see here. His extensive description of Raphael's frescoes in the Vatican, and especially in the Chigi Loggia, was published only posthumously. But in his lifetime, he defended these frescoes with his praise, and he sponsored their restoration by Carlo Maratta. It's Bellori, not surprisingly, who provides an extensive account of Anibale Caracci's funeral and burial in the Pantheon in Rome in July 1609, claiming wrongly that it was attended by the members of the Accademia di San Luca and accurately by Monsignor Agucchi. He compares Anibale's unfortunate death to Raphael's and he even claims that undisclosed disordini amorosi hurried things along drawing the parallel even closer, and claiming that Anibale himself wished to be buried beside Raphael. In that ancient temple were preserved, says Bellori, the illustrious ashes of two of the most celebrated painters whose great spirits one can hope will join in heaven in God. Now Malvasia sets his account of Anibale's burial in the context of the deaths of Agostino and Ludovico, making no mention whatsoever of the Academia di San Luca. He includes Agucchi's heartbreaking letter of July 15, 1609, to Dolcini in Bologna, asking him to break the news of Anibale's death to his uh, cousin Ludovico. Without suggesting that Anibale had sought burial next to Raphael, Agucchi notes that it was Agostino's son, Antonio Caracci, who made the plans. And he writes... I do not know what the opinion is of him in your city. Of course, Anibale had been out of Bologna for many years. But in the view of the chief painters in Rome, he was the greatest painter in the world. And this, of course, is this just remarkable late portrait of the tragic uh, Anibale uh, suffering so much 
uh, from his treatment at the hands of uh, the Farnese after his great masterpiece had been completed. Committed to modern painting, Malvasia did not share in the worship of Raphael and the antique, which, even as it would dominate the future, looked backwards, failing to give due appreciation to the painterly traditions of Lombardy and Venice, no matter how respectful Bellori was to Rubens and even Anibale's beginnings in Bologna. And in his vigorous denial of Roman preeminence and its divine artist, Malvasia made a fatal mistake from which he was never to recover. His infamous characterization in the Felsina of Raphael as a boccalaio urbinate, or pot maker from Urbino, who had to rely on humanists like Jovio, Ptolemy, and Malta and the like for his inventions spread like wildfire uh, from Bologna to Rome and around uh, Europe. Um, here we are, we didn't do this to the book, I'm happy to say, it's a highlight on the PowerPoint. Um, and uh, it's a remarkably rare copy, as I will explain in a moment. This was not uh, Malvestia's only criticism of Raphael, in which he uh, seems to su suggest that he's not really a master painter, he's really a craftsman uh, working in this tradition of uh, the production and painting of uh, terracotta, um, many of which, of course, uh, of these productions were decorated by inventions taken from Raphael. And, and Malvasia is suggesting he's simply one of these kind of hack uh, painters. He's not a true inventor. And this was not his only cr criticism of Raphael in the face of Vasari's excessive praise. Comments on the dryness of his manner abound. Malvasia's insult, I would say, also reflects his delight in the practice among Bolognese artists of assigning derogatory nicknames, recording, as he does, Albani calling Guercino lo sfumante and Guido smorza zolfanello. He even reported that Titian had jested that Raphael was a secarello, or a little dry one. But the indignity of identifying Raphael, the star of the Roman academies, as a mere craftsman, such as those celebrated by Pico Passo, a painter of those many pots that bore his designs was going too far. Malvasia saw the problem immediately, and he withdrew as many copies as he could, uh, and he withdrew very many, and I'm really delighted to find that this extremely rare copy here is in the collection of the Prado. The Prado owns three copies of, um, uh, of Malvasia, and fortunately, one of them is this uh, very rare example, and he had to uh, reset uh, several sections of the gathering of the book in order to make this change, in order to change it to say uh, the, the most uh, learned and uh, uh, the, the most wonderful idea of the Grand Raphael. So the Boccalaio Urbinate becomes the Grand Raphael, and he manages to fix up a little insult to Michelangelo uh, along the way too. Um, but this had already uh, gone out into uh, the world and caused him terrible trouble. Of the various excellent accounts of this Boccalaio incident, Garcia Cueto's account is especially valuable because following the, works of, uh, the work of Stella Rudolph in Florence, it draws attention to the figure of Vincenzo Vittoria. This Spanish-born pupil of Carlo Maratta, about whom uh, the scholar Bonaventura Basagoda has also written an important study, launched an attack on Malvasia in the form of seven letters dated to seven, uh, 1679, but which he surely wrote later and published in 1703. He claimed to have just read Malvasia's outrageous text in Valencia, where he served as a canon of Thativa. He'd gone back from Rome uh, to Valencia. And to be responding to an inquiry from Orazio Albani, younger brother of Giovanni Francesco Albani, who became Pope Clement XI, on November the 23rd, 1700. Vittoria expresses shock at Malvasia's malign attacks, and not just on Raphael and the Boccalaio, but on the imitation of antiquity and even on the characters and qualities of all the great Bolognese, including those praised by Vasari. Where Vasari had brought honor to the painters of his homeland, writes Vittoria, Bologna had been presented with ugly images of vicious men nourished by envy and ignorance. 
All those painters presented by Malvasia as his heroes are in fact pricked by his pen, which is only sharpened to wound the fame of others. And to make his point, Vittoria designed a frontispiece showing two volumes of the Felsina Beatrice. One of them, uh, you can see here, uh, conveniently open at part three, which is exactly the part in which the Boccolaio uh, appears. And with two hands uh, sharpening a quill, which in fact, an image that, that which uh, recalls quite provocatively, I think, examples in the drawing manual uh, designed a century earlier by Agostino uh, Caracci and engraved by uh, Ciambrellano. So he's sort of using a Caracci image as a way of uh, getting back at Malvasia. The inscription reads, Ut uh, scribat, non feriat, in order to write, not to wound. But its meaning remains a little unclear until we read a quotation from Malvasia himself, just simply called Lautore, uh, on the opposite page, which reads, the pen is a vicious weapon. Even though its tip does not pierce the heart, it lacerates the reputation, which is more precious than life. Vittoria professed shock that the Felsener was full of calumnies, claiming that Malvasia had sharpened his wicked pen to wound the fame of others, even while he claimed to be praising them. Vittoria set out to destroy Malvasia with Malvasia's own words, and this is the opening salvo. Unlike Malvasia, he sharpens his pen not to wound, but to write his observations. Now, not acknowledged by Vittoria is the fact that this sentence appears at the very beginning of Malvasia's life of Banya Cavallo in the Felsina, where reusing Vasari's uh, portrait which he considered actually to be a distorted caricature, Malvasia goes on to excerpt Vasari's life of Banya Cavallo and the group of artists around him as powerful evidence of the Tuscan writer's poisonous hatred for the Bolognese. Vasari, in fact, describes them as ex exemplifying vainglory, false ambition, and failure, their heads full of pride and smoke, and saying that any success they had was owed to the impact of Rome and Raphael. Vasari actually says this, and Malvasia quotes it at length. And in fact, Malvasia was merely taking the war back to the enemy in showing how Vasari, quote, showed talents as defects and virtue as demerit, end quote. But all of this was of no account to Vittoria, who had other ambitions. Vittoria's letters are not without interest. His first concern is to defend Il Gran Raffaello di Urbino, whose memory he worshipped. He defends the Roman Anibale from the charges that he'd been ruined by Raphael and the antique that Malvasia made. He insists on the importance of studying antiquities, pointing to passages where Malvasia himself records this practice in Bologna. He especially defends Raphael from the idea that he was supplied with inventions by others, which was the real key to the Boccolaio scandal, saying that the elaboration of inventions is the responsibility of the artist, and that painting is not just un pezzo di nudo. He's claiming that Malvasia, through his embrace of colore and brushwork, is saying it's just un pezzo di nudo, imitated in paint with pastosità and morbidezza. There goes the whole Venetian Lombard school. Anibale was not an ignorant and envious person, but quite capable of producing the Farnese Gallery on his own without the help of Ludovico or Agostino, as Malvasia had claimed. Vittoria took a special exception to the idea that's been so central to our discussions, and that is that the qualities of the four Karachi students led them to advance beyond their teachers. This would, writes Vittoria, mean that the Karachi were deficient in all these things, and that if the pupils outdid their masters, then they were also conquering Correggio, Raphael, Michelangelo, and Titian, which was clearly preposterous. Vittoria's real purpose, as Cueto and others have indicated, was frankly opportunistic, seeking to gain the favor of the new Albani Pope, seen here just before his election. He was also seeking to ingratiate himself with his teacher, Carlo Morata, who was by then perpetual principe of the Academia di San Luca and who loathed Malvasia. Garcia Cueto has pointed to the anonymous account of around 1705, recording a visit by Malvasia to the Montione Chapel in Santa Maria in Monte Santo. Here we are, of course, Piazza del Popolo. Here is Santa Maria 
in Monte Santo, looking at altarpieces by Maratta and his pupil, Niccolo Berrettoni. Sorry about these, it's the best I could get. Amalthusia said they were both beautiful, but that one day the work of the pupil would be considered that of the master. Malvasia once again embracing a movement forward and novelty and the modern. This spread around Rome very quickly, and Maratta, we are told, never forgave Malvasia, who naturally responded that he was only trying to be funny. This loathing that uh, he uh, inspired continued after Malvasia's death, and Maratta certainly encouraged Vittoria's attack. In his imaginary evocation of Maratta's academy, stocked with three volumes of engravings by and after the Caracci, including the works of Agostino and Danibale, and also including the Arti di Bologna and Cesio's Farnese print, so the whole range of the production of the Caracci, Vittoria sets up a discussion amongst himself, Maratta and Bellori. It's an imaginary conversation. And among the topics discussed was the rebirth of painting by Cimabue and its progress under Masaccio up to its perfection in Raphael, after which it then declined. Now, this would surely have annoyed Malvasia, given his views on Vasari's paradigm of a rebirth at the time of Cimabue. But after that, the discussion of Raphael in this academy, which of course was envisioned by Maratta himself, as a sort of living school of Athens dedicated to drawing, might have enraged Malvasia. For Bellori and Vittoria, Raphael was the appellees of modern painting. And Bellori added, even if some painters, including Caraggio and Titian, excelled in certain parts of painting, only Raphael was excellent in everything. That Bellori, Vittoria characters in this conversation had Malvasia in mind is clear from the references to Raphael's Spasimo di Sicilia, in which one of them says that Cardinal Massimi had reported that the king of Spain greatly admired it. Malvasia had, of course, reported the opposite. The king didn't like it. And to the Boccalaio. To cap all of this, Vittoria was also planning a catalogue of prints of the works of Raphael based on his own collection. Now here, he surely had Malvasia's example before him. In the Felsener, Malvasia had attempted an exhaustive catalogue of prints made by Bolognese printmakers or after Bolognese artists, listing some 1,000 prints, complete with dedications and inscriptions. This was a remarkable innovation, as Naoko Takahatake will show in her forthcoming publication for the Malvasia project. It is, in fact, the first real catalogue raisonné in the history of art, and quite an amazing thing. And at the very beginning of it, Malvasia uh, publishes uh, in the margin a ruler for half a Bolognese foot divided into onche, so that he says everybody can use it as a kind of a standard. Vittoria, in making his catalogue of the Prince of Raphael, uh, which was never published, was not to be outdone. And he drew uh, over here a mezzo palmo romo, romano antico in the margin of his text. Yet again, Rome then was triumphing over Bologna one more time. Now, Malvasia was not without his defenders. And after reading Vittoria's observations, Gian Pietro Cavazzoni Zanotti, Bolognese painter and writer, composed his Lettere Familiari, scritte ad un amico in difesa del conte Carlo Cesare Malvasia, published in 1706. In his notes to his copy of Vittoria, he records that Ulisse Gozzadini, great man from Bologna, had informed him that this miserable figure, Vittoria, had written against Malvasia, looking for criticisms of Raphael simply in order to attract Pope Clement XI. Che ha tanta parzialità per Raffaello suo concittadino, who was so keen on his fellow citizen, uh, Raphael. Zanotti presents a blow-by-blow -blow refutation of Vittoria. It was simply not true that Malvasia despised Rome and its art and the imitation of antiquities. Nor was it true that he'd said that painting was all pastosità and vaghezza. He dismissed Vittoria's statement that Malvasia held Raphael to be a man of no value as just another unsubstantiated story. Zanotti also showed 
that Vittoria's quotations from the Conférence of the French Academy were entirely partial and incomplete. French Academy plays quite a role here, and in fact, the Royal Academy of Painting in Sculpture in Paris debated both sets of letters in 1705-6 and 1708, and Giovanni Perini-Folasani and Carlo Alberto Girotto have both traced the special interest taken in Malvasia by the Roman, uh, sorry, by the Parisian uh, critic Roger de Peel. Uh, this is a wonderful copy of the Felsiner, which is now at Harvard, uh, which bears the coats of arms of the French uh, and with the beautifully embossed binding made for the King of France. And this copy, which is in the Inasha in Paris, which actually once belonged to Roger de Peel, and there's very clear evidence uh, that um, de Peel read it carefully. The support for Malvasia among partisans of color is not surprising. For the post-publication debate re reveals the extent to which the Felsen itself contained within its covers an expression of the relative values of disegno and colore that would fu fuel these French debates for years. The practice of debate is in itself fundamental for understanding the growing divide between Malvasia and his Roman contemporaries, while helping to explain his closer relationship to the French critics he often cited. Malvasia prided himself on writing lives, and not, as he put it, in a letter to Aprosio in 1673, weaving eulogies. I'm giving reports, he writes, not writing panegyrics. If I were to conceal actions that deserve blame and show only those deserving praise, what credit would I find with the learned? Zanotti understood this, writing that Vittoria wished to hear no criticism of any painter, quote, as if he was writing the panegyric of a saint. Vittoria, he said, simply couldn't understand that great artists might be jealous of each other. And he added, artists are not saints, devoted to overcoming their passions, pursuing instead the perfection of their art and often for modest rewards. Now in the 17th century, debates over the writing of history gave considerable attention to questions of praise and blame, not to mention adulation and truth. The notable Roman Jesuit, Agostino Mascardi, whose Dell'Arte Historica, published in 1636, was read by Nicholas Poussin, insisted that the historian cleave to the truth without excessive praise or blame. Even the scriptures, he wrote, do not omit adultery and murder by David, the denial of Peter, and the sins of the Magdalene. Malvasia's painters were human, the figure of Raphael embraced by the Roman Academy, divine. In Paris, at least, the different qualities of painters could be subjected to scrutiny. In the famous scale of values, which you see here, published in his Balance des Pages, Roger de Peel discriminated amongst the qualities of some 56 painters. Rubens and Guercino, quite amazingly, excelled Raphael in composition, and Titian and Van Dyck outranked him in color. If nobody scored higher than Raphael in drawing and expression, Domenichino and Rubens came close. The principle of de Peel's balance, that painters had different ways of excelling and that no one artist was perfect in all respects, was essentially that established by Malvasia in a modern history written in the spirit of the Caracci's motto of contentione perfectus, and which persists as a principle of painting, I think, even today. Meanwhile, in Rome, the pursuit of ideal beauty espoused by Bellori and Carlo Maratta, based on the cult of Raphael and antiquity, flourished. In his unfinished biography of Maratta, Bellori writes that although the painter studied the works of the Caracci, Correggio, Titian, and Guido Reni, he always returned to Raphael, against those who, in their books, called Raphael's style, style dry and rigid, secca e statuino, and that, of course, meant Malvasia, Maratta responded that it was their brain that was made of stone. Quoting Maratta's op opposition to teachers who said that it was enough to please the eye and imitate nature, Bellori also silently paraphrased Malvasia's statement from the beginning of the life of Guercino, which I mentioned a couple of weeks ago, that beautiful coloring constituted 99% of painting. Against such sensual and painterly naturalism, Maratta held up 
the Vatican frescoes as the best school for painting. And again, his own ideal academy uh, of disegno reflects this. Bellori rarely includes documents, unlike Malvasia. But in the life of Maratta, he transcribed the papal bull issued by Innocent XII on 9th of June, 1693, and signed by Cardinal Albani, appointing Maratta custodis pictorarum Raphaelis, curator, in a way, guardian of the paintings of Raphael in the Vatican. He also includes the epitaphs composed by Maratta for Raphael and Anibale in association with the elaborate tombs he prepared in 1674. And the tomb uh, for Anibale, the design for the tomb for Anibale, uh, possibly uh, influenced by this earlier design by Algardi, uh, but certainly not uh, uh, surviving uh, today. Of Anibale, Maratta wrote that he was equal to Raphael in genius and fame, though unequal in fortune. I think that's right here, uh, dispara fortuna, uh, a great, a, as great an artist, but not as fortunate. It was just four years after this that Malvasia thumbed his nose at such Roman gravity by calling Raphael a pot painter with no invention. In Rome, Raphael was no longer the brilliant young artist from Urbino who had everything to learn and who died young after learning everything. But he becomes uh, a figure of, of almost uh, divine imagery uh, celebrated uh, for his uh, perfection. And Anibale Caracci, on the other hand, was no longer the melancholy figure whose Bolognese spirit had been crushed in Rome, but now turned into the modern emulator of Raphael. Mascardi warned that while love of country, friends, and family is a good quality, this can be a bad thing in a historian whose affections are not corrected by maturity of judgment. Malvasia was paradoxically accused of excessive attachment to his native Bologna, despite his notoriously critical pen and Vittoria's attack, which accused him of uh, simply destroying local traditions. And this view persists even now. But in his own words, he sought only to preserve knowledge of Bolognese painting for the future. And I quote, when the world understands, he writes, what a school of art Bologna, home of my fellow citizens, has been and still is, then I will have achieved my intent and gained the merit I hoped for and claimed through my diligence and effort, end quote. This Malvasia did achieve, though he could not delay the steady march of classicism in Rome and the adoption in Paris of Poussin's new classical style founded on Raphael and Titian. But the artists he cherished, especially the Caracci and their school, were firmly established in the history of art, and they're probably better remembered today, dare I say so, than Carlo Maratta, who emulated both Domenichino and, of course, uh, Guido Reni, or such Roman successors as Pompeo Batoni or Corrado uh, Giaquinto. Wonderful painters, but very, very much uh, dependent on the new Bolognese style. In the end, Malvasia was defeated by critical orthodoxy. His sharp pen turned as a weapon against himself. This is not to deny the originality of Bellori. After all, he found a way to incorporate the material realism of Caravaggio into his story, which Malvasia saw, saw no reason to do, though for him, Guercino was Caravaggio perfected. And he recognized the values of naturalism and color in Rubens and Lanfranco. But when Bellori died in 1695, he was, in the words of Giovanni Previtali, un personaggio semi-legendario, had achieved such fame. In the decades after 1672, when the lives came out, Bellori had consol consolidated his position on the absolute authority of Raphael, the antique, and the preeminence of Rome. If Malvasia's views found their way, as we've seen, into the world of painters in Paris, Bellori's Roman classicism was adopted by the academies and collectors, especially in the Eternal City. Bellori's views on ideal beauty were adopted most powerfully by Winkelmann, whose establishment of the idea of a permanent ancient ideal reborn in the 16th century dominated the history of art for centuries. In a story too long to tell, 
grew the notion, which is definitely not that of Vasari, of an Italian Renaissance that reached its fulfillment with Raphael's classical ideal style. This eventually provided a standard of perfection that was not historical but absolute, culminating, for example, and it is just an example, in E.H. Gombrich's 20th century view that the beauty of a Raphael Madonna lies outside personal taste or preference and stands as a defense against what he calls relativism. Against this and against the cultural prejudices of a reformed religion concerning the emotional fervor of much Bolognese painting, and you remember uh, how much Goethe admired this but then shocked at the, uh, at the open uh, wound, Malvasia's painstaking attempt to write history, not panegyric, had little hope of success. But I want to say in conclusion that for those of us attempting to write history of art today, he can provide at least a glimmer of hope against the inev inevitability and the power of the norm, as well as ways, I think, of coming to grips critically about why, for example, the Saint Sebastian by Guido Reni was once so popular here at the Prado, as I mentioned in my first lecture, and that Domenichino's Last Communion of Saint Jerome was thought for centuries by painters and critics alike to be the second greatest painting in the world after Raphael's transfiguration. And why it was that Ludovico Caracci, in the words of Guido Reni, as they were reported by Malvasia himself, was once considered, and here is Guido in the mouth of, uh, or, uh, Guido as reported by Malvasia, that he was once considered, quote, the best painter the world has ever known and whose equal it will never again see. And I hope to have explained why that is the case. Thank you very much. <laughs>